basically, uh, what it is all about. And we need to be aware of that uh, various falsifications coming to us through the Catholic Church. The Catholic world, as I said, has enormous respect for whatever message that Virgin brings. Now, what is important for us as the followers of Christ is to understand the real Mary in the Bible, brethren, as opposed to the Catholic Mary the millions are worshipping. There are five major errors concerning Mary. So please note those five major errors. One, the Immaculate Conception. That is the doctrine that Mary, though she was conceived naturally, not a virgin birth for her, she was conceived naturally, was nevertheless, from the moment of conception, free from the stain of original sin. Now, this is entirely a Catholic invention, you see. The Bible says nothing to that effect. It was invented because of the sex is dirty idea, so they came up with this immaculate conception of Mary. Second major error is, Mary is a perpetual virgin. The Bible makes it clear, very clear, she was not. Not only did she have other children, but she had at least six of them after Jesus Christ. The third major error, the Mary is in heaven. No, brethren, she is not. The Bible shows that she is dead and buried awaiting the resurrection. You know John 3.13 came up these days very often. No one has gone to heaven except the one who came down from heaven, that is Jesus Christ. So Mary is not in heaven. She is Certainly in hell, brethren, when I say hell, that's the Greek word Hades, which means grave, translated as hell in certain places of your King James Bible. So once again, millions of people are praying to a person in heaven who just is not there. The fourth major and the fifth error, these are the couple of errors that sometimes we can make even in the church of God. The last two of these five major errors concerning Mary. Look, fourth one. If Mary didn't have any immaculate conception, if she was not a perpetual virgin, and if she is not up in heaven, surely, as the righteous woman, she was, she was at least converted. Once again, brethren, the answer is no. The answer is no, Mary was not converted. Not during the lifetime of Jesus Christ. We'll see that later. Then a fifth major error also can make we can also make that as the members of the church of god is this if she was not converted at least we could say that mary supported jesus christ in his work we could be wrong brethren we would be very wrong again we couldn't be more wrong mary was opposed to his ministry this comes as a shock to you but we'll see that in the scripture brethren that is why we are talking today about the real mary of the bible not the one that the Catholics portray or that others may falsely believe. We're talking about the real Mary of the Bible, you see. If you spelled out those five points to any Catholics in the world today, it would come as a total shock to them. In fact, any one of those five that we would proclaim would be ranked heretical by the Catholic Church because they believe in immaculate conception, that Mary was a perpetual virgin, and that they most certainly believe that she is up there in heaven as a mediator, as an advocate between them and Jesus Christ and the Father. She is to them the soft touch, so to speak, you know. So many of them pray to Mary to get her, to get Christ and the Father to do what they want to fulfill their request in prayer. Now let's examine the kind of person that Mary really was because she has been deified by the Catholics as something that is she is not. She was a unique human being, that's sure, because of the virgin birth, but she was better than a normal human being at the same time. Righteous, but normal. Not the way that they would portray her in their pictures and in their teachings uh, that they promote as the teachings of Mary. First of all, let us take a look at Mary's background. Now, for the virgin birth of Jesus Christ, it could not have been just any righteous virgin on earth at that time. When we read of Mary as the righteous virgin, it doesn't necessarily mean that she was the only righteous virgin in Israel. There may have been many young girls who were dedicated and devoted to God, but to be the one chosen of God, you not only had to be spiritually especially righteous, you had to have something else, brethren. What is that else? Jesus Christ is a descendant of King David, you see. So, you had to be, you had to have royal blood because Jesus had to be a descendant as a future king of the world from David's line according to the prophecies. So both Mary and Joseph had royal blood and were descended from King David. Joseph was descended from David's son Solomon and Mary was descended from David's son Nathan, you see. Not Nathan the prophet, of course, but another con contemporaneous Nathan who was a son of David. So it wasn't necessarily that she was the only righteous virgin in Israel. There might have been 
far in between perhaps, you know, but there could have been others, that's for sure. He had to be a virgin who was righteous, but also had royal blood in her veins for the prophets, prophecies in the Bible to be fulfilled. Now, as we said earlier, Mary was obviously a unique individual because she is the only person in history that had virgin birth and had given birth, as we understand, to the Messiah of God. But let us take a look at now, having understood her background, to her life as the mother of Christ, because this brings us to the sixth error that the Catholics around the world would believe. They would think, brethren, that to be mother of Jesus Christ, that would involve a life of a total bliss. Right? Because after all, you know, had the Messiah, you know, she, you have Messiah for your son. You know, that must be a total bliss. And as you walk around, both of you would have probably a halo over your heads. And Mary was free from original sin, so probably her feet always walked like five centimeters over the ground or two inches over the ground. She was just so special as Jesus Christ was. That's how they portray her, brethren. But no, no, on the contrary, life of the mother of Christ was not all joy. Not at all. It meant a hard and difficult road for Mary. This is another misunderstanding that her life must have been one of a total bliss to be the mother of the Messiah. Certainly, brethren, certainly there were moments of a great happiness, but there were many trials that Mary had to go through simply because she became the mother of the Messiah of the God of the Old Testament, Jesus Christ. Let's go now to chapter to the first chapter of Luke, the Gospel of Luke, chapter 1, beginning in verse 26. Let's go there so that we can understand true Mary, the true Mary in the Bible, brethren, the real Mary, so different from Mary of this world, Mary that millions worship, Mary that is emphasized by the present Pope because of her possible role to bring about the world peace. Luke chapter 1 and verse 26. Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth. Now this is the sixth month here, here refers to the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy with John the Baptist. And that's how we determine exactly when Jesus Christ was born. In other words, that he was not born in winter. He had to be born in the fall season, around this time, around the Feast of Tabernacles, and very possibly that he was born even on the Feast of Trumpets. So, verse 27. To a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. Verse 29. But when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and considered what manner of greeting this was. Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Now let us notice the next three verses, please, because they're very explicit about what would take place to her and what she would have, would give birth to. Verse 31. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great, he will be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. So you have the gospel of the kingdom right there, brethren, at, you know, at the heart and the core of the, of the, of the birth of Jesus Christ. And those three verses, you see, 31 to 33, brethren, they make absolutely clear that the angel was talking about the Messiah. So there was no doubt about that. Now you would think that thereafter, for the next 33 and a half years of her, of her life, Mary would never doubt in her mind who she gave birth to. But Mary was a human being like the rest of us. As we all have doubts, as we have questions, so Mary did also have those later on. Satan would put doubts in her mind, and time and again it is clear from the Bible that she did not fully understand her son, Jesus Christ, and did not fully understand then his messiahship. Let's now drop to verse 46. No, so Mary rejoiced before God. She was willing, she was a willing servant of God, handmade for the eternal, and she said in verse 46, my soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior, for he has regarded the lowly state of his maid servant. For behold, henceforth all generations will call me blessed. So she understood it, brethren, at that point, that she wasn't able to hang on to it with a firmer grip. You know, But all generations certainly after that have uh, certainly called Mary blessed. You know how Catholics have this uh, this prayer all the time, you know, blessed are you among the women and so on. But yes, all generations call her blessed. But many, many generations over the past 2,000 plus years have deified her brethren into something that she is not because she is not yet deified. 
she will be at the resurrection, just like the rest of us. Mary did come to convert to conversion one day, but not in the life of Jesus Christ. She was a righteous individual. She served God, but conversion came, uh, you know, conversion that is came to her after the death of her son. Just like you see the same process, brethren, that we all go through. And the same process of conversion that uh, we are all going through still until the very end. And the same process that the three of you yesterday entered when you entered into covenant with God. So verse 56. And Mary remained with her about three months, speaking of her aunt Elizabeth, and returned to her house. So we saw in the initial scripture, we read that Elizabeth was six months pregnant already. So if Mary stayed there for the last three months of her pregnancy, obviously it was to help with the delivery of John the Baptist, you see. At that point she returned home. So when Gabriel appeared to her, he said, you shall bring forth a son. Now when Gabriel made that statement to her, Jesus Christ was still in heaven, the God of the Old Testament. For almost immediately after that, Jesus Christ emptied himself of his Godhead and entered into the womb of Mary, that little speck of beginning human life. So the initial three months of her pregnancy were spent with Elizabeth, helping Elizabeth to deliver John the Baptist. When we put together certain scriptures, as you know, we see that Jesus Christ was born six months after the birth of John the Baptist. So all the indications are here that by the time Mary returned home, she was three months pregnant. So may not have been showing it at that point, but you know, given a month or two, it began to show. Can you just imagine the reaction of the surroundings? Mary was espoused to Joseph. Now what do we think was the reaction of the relatives when she began to show her pregnancy upon her return? The assumption was obviously that while she had been away from home, she had committed fornication. Let us go to Matthew chapter 1. And please remember, brethren, that all that we say of Mary today, in contrast to what the Catholics think of her, Mary was a righteous individual. She was most certainly a Proverb 31 woman. But she did not understand many the things that took place in her life, you see. And far from a life of total joy and happiness of the mother of Jesus Christ, there was much sorrow that came her way. The only sorrow that the Catholics would recognize, basically, is that of crucifixion. But there was an awful lot more between the birth of Jesus Christ and the death of Jesus Christ that Mary had to go through. So it is certain that Mary had the joy of Gabriel's message. She had the joy of witnessing and helping with the birth of John the Baptist. But now the trouble began. She had returned home in the showing stages of her pregnancy. Undoubtedly the question was on her mind, what would my relatives think? What would my beloved Joseph think? Who would believe that it was a virgin birth? Such a thing was unheard of. And for the relatives that watched that little girl grow up, who do you think you're joking with that it is a virgin birth? Oh, come on. So who would believe her? A young woman that an angel of God had appeared to her and told her something that never happened before in the history of humankind that she would give birth to the Savior and do it by a virgin birth. No, brethren, nobody believed that. Joseph didn't believe it either. If she had tried to tell him, you know, if she even tried to tell him and convince him, but, you know, would he believe it? <laughs> Perhaps in a wisdom, she didn't even try to tell him, but now her reputation was sealed because she knew what the local gossip would be when she returned home. Matthew 1, verse 19. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man, and not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. So, you know, Joseph, like everyone else, made the logical assumption. They didn't think, oh, there has to be a virgin birth. How wonderful. No, brethren, they said, what do you do when you left? What did you do when you left home, you know? So Joseph's assumption quite clearly, in that he was going to put her away, though secretly, was that she committed fornication. So imagine the emotional trauma Mary was going through at this time. To be found guilty when she was actually innocent. And to be afraid that she would lose the love of a man that she was so enchanted with because Joseph was obviously a very special individual. But God at some point, of course, intervened for her. Verse 20. But while she thought, while he thought, that's Joseph, while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream saying, Joseph, son of David, 
Do not be afraid to take you to you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her in her is of the Holy Spirit. So Joseph had a dream. He doesn't say really that anyone else had it. So 30 years later, the assumption of all the other relatives and the people in the neighborhood was still that Mary had committed fornication, brethren. We will see that from the scriptures. There was a stigma that she had to bear as mother of Christ for the rest of her life. Joseph was no longer fooled. He understood the truth. But others around there who had thought of Mary as sweet and wonderful person, they were shocked. And the gossip continued. It reappeared again in the later part of Jesus Christ's life. Luke chapter 2. Be quiet, darling. Whisper it again. Luke chapter 2 verse 1. Beginning verse 1. Now he was her first child. So Mary was not perpetual virgin, of course. We know that from the scripture. It's amazing how many people just are fooled that she was virgin forever. Rather than it's even contrary. Forgive me for this. For this one thing to tell you, it was contrary to the Jewish practice of life. The Jews, even to these days, very much uh, support marriage and family and birth of children in plural. In fact, observant Jews, as you probably know, have a multitude of children. So therefore, this is totally contrary. Could you believe a man gets married and he and she remains with a man in a marriage and she remains virgin for all of her life? Doesn't make any sense. Just like the Babylonian born. Doctrines don't make any sense when you think about them. But anyway, Luke chapter 2, beginning with 1, he was her first child. To her, he was still special because of the message that has been given to her by Gabriel. But like any woman, you know, having her first child, she would want the best circumstances for it. So instead, we find in Luke 2 that taxing of the Roman world came about... And Joseph, in verse 4, was forced to go out of Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, into Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David. Verse 5, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. Now you see how it is constantly mentioned about Joseph that he was descendant of, of David. You see, that was very important. Luke 2, uh, we have read that. Uh, first plans... To have her baby at home, you know, that was first plans, you know, to have baby at home, that's logical. Mothers will be delivered at the, in those days at homes. So the home that Joseph built for her or bought for her was shattered because of the events that began to take place there. In her last month of pregnancy, she was forced, brother, into a different circumstance to make a trip. Rather than having a baby at home and to be able to show it to the relatives, she had to go down to Bethlehem for it to be born again in fulfillment of God's prophecies. Now it becomes clear, brethren, as we study Luke chapter 2, that Mary didn't understand all that was going on. Now you can say it was black and white in Luke chapter 1 about what Gabriel said, but now many times do we read the Bible and we find things black and white, and then later on we can start to question again, we can have doubts again, etc., etc. So people do that. Now Mary was a righteous individual, but God did not at this point give her all understanding and continued understanding of what was going on. Luke chapter 2 verse 16. The shepherds came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. Now when they had seen him, they made widely known the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all those who heard it marveled at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. You see, she didn't say, oh, naturally, yeah, well, the angel spoke to me. He spoke the truth. I've given birth to the Messiah. No, she wondered about it, brethren, you see. What does the, all this mean? She didn't say, oh, it's so obvious what it's all, uh, this is all about, you know. No, brethren, she questioned it. And as we go along here, we will see all the questions that were on her mind. Verse 25. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's, uh, the Lord's Christ. And then we see how he was guided to the temple, pushed by the Spirit. There are times when God's Spirit works with us and puts us in certain situations, right? Well, me sitting here in Australia is probably one of those examples. Even though I wasn't really very excited about coming to Australia, I told you that many times. 
uh, at least my four cats either were not very excited at all, <laughs> because I'll be away for a long time. <laughs> Verse 27, so he came by the Spirit into the temple, speaking of Simeon, and when that, when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you're letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. And then notice, by the next three verses. Clearly again, a prophecy of the Messiah. We have three verses when Gabriel pronounced it as well. Verse 30. For my eyes have seen your salvation which you have prepared before the face of all the peoples, a light to bring revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. Now notice please verse 33. And Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. You know they should have said, well naturally, that's right, we heard that from Gabriel. It was some time later. It was not so solid in their minds anymore, brethren. Their memory had faded a little bit. They marveled. We would expect them to say, that's obvious. But no, instead they were amazed. Verse 34. The Simeon, then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary his mother, Behold, this child is destined for the fall and rising of many in Israel and for a sign which will be spoken against Yes, a sword will pierce through your own soul also, that the, th- that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. Have you noticed, brethren? A sword will pierce through your so- own soul also. And it was to do that at the crucifixion. But there would be an emotional moment for Mary during her life when a sword would pierce it. Never so greater it was than at the crucifixion. But still, there were other times of hardships, times of difficulty. Matthew chapter 2. Matthew chapter 2, after their visit to Jerusalem to pre- present the sacrifice for the birth of the child, because Bethlehem was not that far away, they returned to their home, to Nazareth. In verse 11, we have a reference to their home. And when they had come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshipped him and when they had opened their treasures, they presented gifts to him. Gold, frankincense, and mirth. Speaking of the so-called three magi. Brethren, they were not three magi at all. It's not nowhere in the Bible. In fact, Josephus tells us that they were the envoys of the Parthian Empire, which was composed of the ten tribes of Israel, beyond the Euphrates River. And it was a kingdom. And any descendant of the royal family had the right to become a king regardless of whatever relationship. So there was a council of these wise people and if a king would get ill or if a king just goes mad or if a king just goes cuckoo on you know, his mind, the council was entitled to replace him and to choose whatever, whichever one man would be fit for the office. It could be anyone, including Jesus Christ because he was also descendant of the royal Parthian family, descendant of the ten tribes of Israel, of course. You see how interesting that all is? The true history is always marvelous. So that is, the Josephus tells us, that they actually, there was just, uh, I don't know how many of them, that whole council, I don't know, numbered perhaps 12 or even more people, they just had a whole caravan, a whole caravan that came from Parthia, you know, filled with gold, frankincense, you see, and mirth. In fact, there is a speculation when we read later about Jesus Christ in his life. The apostles were not doing anything. They were not having any profession. There was plenty of money to obviously preach the gospel. Where did it come from? Well, perhaps because there was a tons of, of, of gold which these men brought to him so that he had enough money so that his parents, of course, would save that money. So by the time he grew to, uh, to the age of 30, there will be plenty of money to do the gospel and just dedicate your life to it. Amazing. So again, please get out of your mind this three magi story because very soon there comes Christmas time and they'll just put forth again this, 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 this lie about the three magi who came. No, brethren, it was a caravan. Read Josephus. We'll find that in Josephus. Uh, that should be in the book of, uh, uh, either history of the Jews or, I'll find it. I don't know. Anyway, we'll find it. It's there. So there's no reason to live in, in, in lie when we have the, uh, Josephus was the contemporary of Jesus Christ and his apostles. He was the, also the governor of uh, Galilee. 
who surrendered to the Romans, and the Romans attacked the Galilee, he surrendered to the Romans, so to spare the population from terrible loss, and he became Roman citizen, and he became later the historian. He was there at the uh, at Jerusalem with the Roman armies in 70, when the Roman armies were attacking Jerusalem, and he was the first-hand witness what happened there. And, you know, what happened there, the Romans tried... How brutal they are. The Romans tried nevertheless to save as many people as they could. They were calling them to surrender, and they were promised if they surrender, the city will be spared. But no, the inside corrupted government, sounds familiar to all of us, the inside corrupted government, of course, would not let it happen. They tried to trap their own people from not being able to surrender to Romans, and that's how it attacked uh, against Jerusalem happened. And then the temple, as you know, the second temple was destroyed as a result. Anyway, just this was another <laughs> another little little bits and pieces of information. Do not fall for this lie about three magi. There were not three magi. There was a whole caravan, caravan, diplomatic caravan, and you wonder, they just go, they storm into the Herod's office and say, where is the king of the Jews? Who would dare do that? Well, they dare do that because in the history... But our falsified history will not tell us. In the history, the Parthian Empire conquered Roman Empire about three or five times. And the Romans were just defeated so terribly a few times that the instruction from Rome to Herod was, look, dare you not enter into any conflict with the Parthian Empire. The moment you do, your head is off. And because of that, so Herod had to be nice and kind of humble, you know, pre- pretend to be humble when they stormed into his office and said, where is the king of the Jews? We want to go and bow down to him, you know. So here this caravan came to Mary, you see, and we have in Matthew 2, we have just read verse 11. And this was probably a year after Jesus Christ's birth because they referred to those wise men, the Magi, and they came, that came in verse 1. And once again, brethren, the Catholic concept is that there were three of them. That's the Catholic concept, brethren. But sadly, it's becoming a Protestant concept as well. Where did they get it? From Sola Scriptura. There is no, any, any number of those people mentioned, you know, as three. Not at all. But we have a historical record. But obviously, Protestants don't care anymore about history. If they did, then the history of the true church would have to shake them up a little bit. As well as the Catholics as well. So the Bible does not say how many. The Magi, again, as I told you, were representatives of the lost tribes of Israel that saw that star and came down, for Israel was kept in captivity around the Caucasus Asia in the Middle East. Now, does it all make sense? Yes, of course it makes sense. Bible history, true history, makes perfect sense. Verse 12. Then, being divinely warned in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed for their own country another way. Now when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother, flee to Egypt, and stay there until I bring you word. For Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. So they had only just briefly returned to Nazareth for a few months. They get this wonderful visit from the wise men from the east, and then, as a result of the visit of these wise men, brethren, Herod was seeking the life of a child because he recognized him as a fulfillment of a certain prophecy in the Old Testament about the one who, in his mind, could take over his throne. So now, after going to Bethlehem for the birth of the child, returning to home to Nazareth, and being there for just a short time, they are now forced to flee for their lives in a forced emigration to another country, Egypt. Now you tell me, would you be love to be, would you love to be moved a little bit, you know, a little bit to New Zealand, a little bit to Micronesia, a little bit to Barbados, a little bit because somebody's persecuting you? How about you, New, New Zealanders? Would you like to be moved a little bit to Europe and then a little bit to Asia, here, there, and everywhere with all of your dogs and all your possessions, you know, because somebody's persecuting you? Just think about it. What kind of blissful life is that, you know? That's the point. What kind of blissful life is that? So now, uh, they went to Egypt, and another hardship now comes. Uh, let me see. The notes are again playing with me, as usual. As usual. Another hardship that came upon them. So perhaps they had no contacts with their relatives during that time. And Jesus Christ might have been three to five years old of age because he came back to the promised, uh, before he came back to the promised land. Verses 19 and 20. Now when Herod was dead, Behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to a dream, in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel, for those who sought the young child, child's love, are now dead. For some period of time, they had to live in an exile from their homeland. Would you love to live like that? And you tell me it's a great bliss. 
Oh, I tell you, it's not. I was in a, in a sort of an exile for about five years, and I tell you, no, it's not a bliss at all. Verse 21. Then he arose, took the young child and his mother, and came into the land of Israel. But when he heard that, that Archelagos was reigning over Judea, instead of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. So, you see, Mary and Joseph now were still afraid for the life of their son. So, verse 23, And being warned by God in a dream, he turned aside into the region of Galilee. Now, interesting, Galilee. And he came and dwelt in a city called Nazareth, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophets, he shall be called a Nazarene. Now, there is another historical thing that I want to draw your attention to. Galilee, the region of Galilee was populated by another people, not really by the Jews, because we see in the scripture that the Jews kind of looked down on Galilee, and you may wonder why. Well, because Galilee was populated by the one only tribe of Israel that remained to be the light for Judah, and that is the tribe of Benjamin. <laughs> and interestingly enough, what else do we find? We find that all the apostles had for one, or the original twelve, or original eleven, were actually from the Galilee. What does that tell you, brethren, about their origin? Only one was of the, Ju- of the house of Judah. That was the Judas Iscariot. But all the other eleven were actually the Galileans. You see, there were Benjamites. Yes, there were religiously Jews, but they were nevertheless by the origin Benjamites. Think about it. You see how brilliant, how interesting, how amazing is the true, <laughs> the true history of God's people from the house of Israel and all the, all the way through from the first church at Pentecost, uh, 31 AD, all the way down to our time. Yeah, if, if those from the first century could see all of your faces now as I can see them, I guess they would be marveling what. But you, they knew there would be people like us. Remember the Apostle Paul? For this blessing at the Pentecost is for you and for your children and for all those afar whom our Lord God will call. So they knew there will be some people down the line. They didn't know how, for how long, but obviously they, they knew there will be the work of God going on for a certain day, for the first day and for a certain length of time. Uh, so far, so so far, what do we see? So far, you see, we have seen Mary. Mary's life was far, far, far from a total bliss. She didn't have engagement. She was suspected of fornication. Her reputation was tarnished in the eyes of her loved one, of her friends and relatives. She had a forced trip in the last month of her pregnancy. After her visit to Jerusalem, Simeon told her of a future hardship she would have to go through. She had a short-lived return to their home in Nazareth. Then she was forced to, into immigration to Egypt. Finally, they were able to return to Nazareth, and we may wonder whether her, their troubles were finally over. You may wonder, brethren, but I guess you know the answer. No, they were not over. No, they were not over because they were still some years away before Christ began his ministry, but there were still trials and hardships for Mary. Mary had to go through as the mother of Jesus Christ many times, in happiness and joy, and in growth and development of her son. Many blessings undoubtedly that God gave her, a righteous woman. Remember how she rejoiced when she heard what the angel had to, had to say to her. So we can also rejoice, brethren, certainly at our baptism. But if we think that life after baptism is going to be a roller coaster ride, there would be a rude awakening because it's far from being a life of bliss. And I told you that many times, not to scare you, but to just uh, keep you always to be in touch with reality, because I'm afraid that certain parts of the Church of God are just getting far away and far off reality. You have to be in reality, and many are the afflictions of the righteous, you know that. Great is his happiness, but there are many sorrows too, until we come to eternal happiness of being resurrected into God's kingdom. Luke chapter 2, and beginning verse 40. We're going now back and forth because why are we going back and forth? Because we're putting these events in their chronological order. So finally you have a, you have a message that puts events in chronological order and although they didn't have to move around anymore for a period of time, it was still hard on occasion to have her son that was so different than everyone else. Just imagine your child so different than everyone else. Just imagine what kind of jealousy, persecution that is drawn on that child. A blessing much of the time, but there are many things that Mary just couldn't quite put together. We said verse 40 in Luke chapter 2, And the child grew and became strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. Now look verse 41. His parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover, and when he was 12 years old, they were they went up to Jerusalem according to the custom of the feast. When they had finished the days, as they returned, the boy Jesus lingered behind in Jerusalem. 
And Joseph and his mother did not know it, but supposing him to have been in the company, they went a day's journey and sought him among their relatives and acquaintances. So when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem seeking him. They really got very, very worried. They were in the state of anxiety, which possibly developed, you know, into a panic by the third day. The child is missing, hey. Now, if they fully understood who Jesus Christ was, the Son of God and the Messiah, they would have seen there was nothing to worry about. You know, God in heaven is his father. He's not going to let anything happen to Jesus Christ. He had a work to do when he grows up. But they didn't think it thoroughly, brethren. They didn't think through that that was because, that way because their minds were not fully tuned into the God's plan with Jesus Christ. So they come back, they came back to Jerusalem seeking him. Now, of course, finally they find him, who else, but in the temple. They should have said, oh, surely this is a logical place for Messiah to be, in the temple of God. But verse 48, so when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said to him, son, why have you done this to us? Look, your father and I have sought you anxiously. They were very fearful, brethren. They were very fearful that Jesus was perhaps kidnapped, maybe killed. But Jesus' response was in verse 49, and he said to them, Why do you seek me? Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? <laughs> no, brethren, they did not understand. Verse 50, But they did not understand the statement which he spoke to them. You see, their minds were not fully open to the truths of who Jesus Christ was and what his work was. Verse 51, Then he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject to them, but his mother kept all these things in her heart. She kept them there, brethren, because she did not fully understand them, you see. If she had complete understanding, she would have dismissed the thing. They would be easy to comprehend, you know, but because they were hard to understand, that is why she made a mental note of them. In a sense, mental note meaning, what does this mean? Now, after the age of 12, very shortly thereafter, there was another great trial for Mary. A further hardship for her as mother of Christ. Widowhood, brethren. Widowhood. Now, being a widow in that, at that time, in that society, without really social security that you enjoy in your Anglo-Saxon world, was not really a best position to be. Widowhood. There is no more record of Joseph in the Bible after the age of 12 of Jesus Christ, after this incident recorded of him in Luke 2. You know, God took Joseph from Mary. She lost her husband early in life. It was a harsh necessity that God had to bring this to pass. Because why? It forced Jesus Christ to be a breadwinner, so to speak, in the home. He now had at least six brothers and sisters to take care of. He was the elder brother. And in the Jewish society, the elder brother was the most now responsible for the family. The elder brother... And a great responsibility was upon his shoulders now that his physical father was dead. Now God took Joseph away from Mary because he wanted Jesus to mature more rapidly than the average individual, brethren. It was another trial that came upon her, Mary, simply because she was the mother of the Messiah. And as I already mentioned to you, in this age of 12, and by, by the time he appears again in the Gospel 30, no, he was not in Tibet, he was not in China, he was not in India. What would he do there? No, brethren, he was in other places because Joseph of Arimathea was Mary's uncle and therefore his mentor, and he would be not in a, among the Gentiles. He went to the lost house of Israel. And that makes perfect sense. And the good news, again I tell you, which implies that the good news was first announced not even to the house of Judah, but once again to the house of Israel. The house of Israel, the lost house of Israel, the the, the constant worry of God eternal. Remember how he said to the apostles, Jesus Christ himself, do not go to the cities of Samaritans, but go rather look for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Yes, exactly. And do you think that was the mission only for the first century? Oh, I don't think so. I don't think so. There are many Israelites out there, brethren, some of them awakening in various parts of the world to their identity. And I believe that's what Hosea did when when, when there was, uh, Hosea was like throwing that seed, you know, it's like throwing the seed into the wind. That wind just blew the house of Israel everywhere. And nowadays, it will be used certainly when Christ comes back, there will be, there'll be the seed of Israel everywhere in all the nations anyway. And that makes sense. And then all the nations will have to be grafted into Israel. Paul says that's a mystery, but a wonderful mystery. But in the meantime, 
My dear lost sheep of Israel in Australia and New Zealand, God is giving you another chance for a mighty work. I keep repeating that to you because I want to, you, you to know who you are, not only as Israelites, but also as the light to this world, as the light to these nations. That's your calling. You must, you must be aware not to become lukewarm in all of that. So, yes, the sheep, lost sheep of the house of Israel, that was always in God's mind. That should be on the mind of all of us as well. But you have people who say, dismiss the, the truth about Israel constantly saying, that's something racist, that's something this, that, that's nothing, that's not really important, that's something historical. It has nothing to do with us in England and Australia. Oh really? Well, what about your blessing? Look at your country. Your country is more beautiful than most of the world out there. Do you realize that? And you say it has nothing to do with us. Oh yes, it has everything to do with you. Because all these marvelous blessings that you have are because you are descendants of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. And because you are lost, you are, you are now lost <laughs> house of Israel, but not anymore. We have found you, we know who we are now. Those of us sitting here, we are not lost anymore. And we have every argument, every argument, to prove to all of your kinsmen in Australia and New Zealand that they are also belonging to the lost house of Israel, you know. They will not accept it, of course, they'll laugh at it, but one of these days they'll be, with crying, the remnant of Israel will go with tears back to its own land in the second exodus. We speak about that on the Sabbath. Be prepared for a bit longer sermon, but I want you to, I want to deliver it here in Australia. I've delivered it twice in Europe in a Gentile country. No, I want to say this to you, to you here in your country, because that second exodus touches upon you directly. You Australians and you New, New Zealanders. And I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm burning within my, myself trying to prove to all of you all the time who you are. Because that is crucial to understand not only the history of humankind, it's crucial to understand your Bible. Unless you know the history of Israel and who the Israel is today, you cannot understand the Bible. There is no way. No way. Luke chapter 4, beginning in verse 16, Christ's ministry now. So he decided to begin it in his hometown. Of course, he grew up in Nazareth, logically, with the people there. He loved the people there, and he wanted to give them the first opportunity to hear the word of God as he began his ministry. We find in the preceding verse of Luke 4, this was after his great trial with Satan, and immediately afterwards he began his ministry. Now, there was a certain work that he did in Galilee, but the first major place recorded for us is in Nazareth, you see. Now, uh, just to remind you, brethren, something that the world does not understand. Jesus Christ was tempted by Satan because he was not to come. The Jews never understood that. They, they always believed, they have never understood that the Messiah had to come twice. That's why, another reason why they did not receive Jesus Christ as their Savior. They always believed from the scripture. They did not really understand that he was to come first as a little baby, to be God, God in the flesh, God with us, to grow up in the flesh and to be killed for our sins. They never understood that. Now, you may wonder, why did he have to go through this temptation? Well, that's exactly why we kept the Day of Atonement, you see. He had to be tempted by Satan in order to qualify when he comes back the second times to become king of the earth, to depose Satan from his Satan from the earthly throne. You see, that was the reason. So immediately after this trial, he got qualified now for the second time to come as the king of kings and the lord of lords. And we have seen now him trying, starting his ministry in Nazareth. Uh, verse 16. So he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. Now the other places in Galilee where he worked are not mentioned, but this one uh, is because obviously it was special to Jesus Christ. It was brethren his home. It was his hometown. So he came to them, and as it turns out, you know when? On the day of Pentecost. When you count all the things, he comes on the day of Pentecost, and he began to quote something from Isaiah, and then he said, Today... The scripture is fulfilled in your hearing, saying that he was the one to whom Isaiah referred to. Well, obviously, what do you think was the reaction? Obviously, they did not stand up too well with, with, with them. They didn't give him a standing ovation, you know, because they all watched little Jesus grow up in their midst, you know, little, just like we're watching little Hannah growing up in our midst and little Noah growing up in our midst. And all of a sudden, here comes this little one. He's now a grown up. And, and obviously he says, oh, look, Isaiah was talking about me. I'm the Messiah. Just think about the reaction of, the, of this. Just think about his mother at that moment. 
you know, Mary having a blissful life. Yeah, sure. So, you know, obviously they didn't stand too well with the people who watched that little one grow up to a man. Who in the world do you think that you are? What ego is? And look verse 28. So all those in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath, and rose up and thrust him out of the city, and they led him to the brow of the hill on which the city was built, and they might throw him down over the cliff. They wanted to kill him, brethren. They were so mad at Jesus Christ, whom they all knew very well because he had grown up in Nazareth. But now they wanted to kill him. You see, well, God's time was such that he was going to preserve Jesus Christ. Verse 30, Then passing through the midst of them, he went his way. Then he went down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and was teaching them on the Sabbaths. Now when it says, uh, when it says Galilee, uh, you wonder now why he went to Galilee. Because they were not the Jews exactly, so they would spare his life. But you see, the Galilee, who was living in the Galilee, was, were the descendants of the tribe of Benjamin. Interesting enough. So even, even, you know, even that little tribe there was, uh, willing to accept him as the Messiah. Telling you once again, brethren, that nevertheless, the house of Judah, as I told you, don't worry about the house of Judah, don't try to convert them. They'll be converted to Christ's return. The first nation you read in the Bible to be converted right away would be the Jews. We read that in Zechariah chapter 14. You know. But you see, the house of Israel still has some people who have Humble hearts, and they will receive this message and will become, hopefully, the saints. Uh, somebody reminded me yesterday that when she was baptized by our deacon Richard Close, now late Richard Close, he told her, welcome, welcome among the saints. <laughs> I told her welcome to the family. He said, welcome among the saints. And Christy Gorman remembered that yesterday uh, as we corresponded about your baptism. By the way, I've, exp- I've told everyone that I'm in contact with, that you, you were baptized, the three of you. The last one that I told this morning was Bob Thiel. <laughs> I thought he could he could be the first, would be the last, and the last would be first. So let's practice that even now. So he was the last one to get, you know, <laughs> from my message. But nevertheless, now everybody else that he's in contact with will, uh, will hear it. So Capernaum, you know, Capernaum seemed to now have become his headquarters for the most part during three and a half years. Uh, years of his ministry. But we could just imagine, brethren, the effect on Mary and Jesus' brothers and sisters when they came to understand that their neighbors had tried to kill Jesus Christ. Just try to imagine, you know, when they heard why their neighbors tried to kill him, because of the crazy thing that Jesus had started to preach. You know, we're going to see that far from supporting the work of Jesus Christ, Mary, brethren, opposed it. It's not in animosity, but in maternal love for her son, because she didn't fully understand the work of God and the work that God had for Jesus to do. Just like relatives to do, do not understand what is the work that God has for you to do. But one of these days, they will understand. So when Mary heard of these events in her hometown, it must have been the time of terrible embarrassment. You know, many of the people, imagine, he was preaching now blasphemy. Her own son preaching blasphemy to what other people thought was blasphemy, you know. And many of the people in their surroundings certainly ostracized Mary and her family. Oh, you know, what kind of a son you brought into this world? He comes back claiming now to be the Messiah. Oh, please. We saw him when he was a little child. We watched him grow up. He watched him play in the dirt, in the sand and so on. Who in the world does he think he is? Mark chapter 3, the Gospel of Mark chapter 3 verse 21. The Gospel of Mark, chapter 3, verse 21. I hope that you find all of this amazing, brethren, and interesting. I'm hoping that... I'm holding your attention, even though the, it's nice, it's outside, it's a very nice day, and uh, and the, the, the sea is roaring and, and, and inviting us, you know, by its wonderful world. But I hope that you find this useful, and it's Mark, chapter 3, verse 21. I hope that you find this interesting, brethren, I'm holding your attention... And yes, I've chosen some messages, especially for you here in Australia, to hold your attention, (laughs) to keep you going through the next year, and to once again that you realize how amazing is this Bible, this book that we read and and, and study. And it's a never-ending, never-ending event. You know, you always find something else that you didn't know before, and then you connect it with everything else that you have known so far, and you think... My word, this is not like a novel we can just read once. That's the book we just read all the time. And we sometimes always discover something else. So, Mark 3, verse 21. When his own people 
heard about this. They went out to lay hold of him, for they said, he's out of his mind. But his own people, that means his kinsmen, his relatives, his mother, his brothers, his sisters. He was preaching and they tried to stop him from what he was doing. Jesus has gone crazy. We have got to stop him before he gets killed himself. That's what they re- That's how they reason. Verse 31. Then his brothers and his mother came. And standing outside, they went, they sent to him, calling him. And a multitude was sitting around him and they said to him, Look, your mother and your brothers are outside seeking you. They were seeking him to what end, brethren? To take him home? They went out there to lay hold of him, saying that he was besides himself. Verse 33. But he answered them, saying, Who is my mother or my brothers? Now this must have been a rejection to a certain extent for Mary, if she ever heard it. Verse 34. And he looked around in a circle at those who sat about him and said, Here are my mother and my brothers. So Jesus Christ said that the women in that room who came to listen to him and believed in him were spiritually closer to him than his own mother because his mother did not believe. And his brothers and sisters didn't believe at the same time, at this time. Well, you know, Mary was still righteous. She still tried to obey God, but she was not converted at this point, brethren. That came later. Verse 35. For whosoever does the will of God is my brother and my sister and my mother. And I'm reading this, I'm reminding now, I'm, I, I'm remembering, somebody at the feast told me, you know, Jesus Christ was always part of my life, part of my decisions and so on. Well, brethren, isn't this what it is all about? That he must always be part of our lives, regardless of what our kinsmen, our relatives think, he always has to be first in our life. So those people who sat around him, they believed in Christ, and I realized there were that there were always those who believed on him and didn't do anything about it. But those who believed in him, you see, were closer to him spiritually than his mother and his brethren were at this time because they were opposed to his work. So Mary was not considered by Christ in one sense as a spiritual mother, at least as close as these were. So he stood, you know, he still loved her, of course, very deeply, and she had taught him the things of the Old Testament. So did Joseph. Jesus respected those teachings, but he respected Mary's devotion to God. She wasn't most certainly a righteous woman, but not yet converted, brethren. Keep that in mind. We must not fall into uh, any errors, including this one, that Mary certainly was aware he was the Messiah. She was the, me- she was the, 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 the mother of the, of the Messiah, so she was converted right away. No, brethren, not at all. Mark chapter 6. A year or so after Jesus visited Nazareth and had nearly been killed, he came back for a second try. (laughs) By this time, after a year or years of his work in his ministry, his reputation was much more firmly established because of the miracles he had done far and wide. And at this time, he didn't come alone. No, he didn't come alone. This time, what he did, well, he brought a following with him. He brought his disciples. Mark chapter 6 Verse 1, Then he went out from there and came to his own country, and his disciples followed him. You see, he wanted to give his own people at Nazareth another chance. He probably felt in his mind that now, after a year or so, they could see many people healed from the miracles I performed, and hear people following me, so maybe they would reconsider. But you see, many hearing him were astonished, brethren. Astonished again. Who does he think he is? Verse 2, And when the Sabbath had come, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many hearing him were astonished, saying, Where did this man get these things? <coughs> and what wisdom is this, which is given to him, that such mighty works are performed by his hands? You see, they could not deny it. <laughs> but they could not accept that it was from him. Just like all your relatives and friends, when they see you change, they will not be able to deny it. Not only by what you eat or what you keep, but also they will not be able to deny that there is change of character in you. But still, they cannot kind of accept it that it's coming from, they cannot, accept, they cannot really understand that it's coming from the high above. So, uh, where were we? Verse 3. Is this not, is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary, and brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simeon? Now we have the names of his four brothers. And are not his sisters here with us? Couple, the history says Jesus had two sisters, by the way. So they were offended at him. You see, they were offended the second time at him. 
This time they didn't try to kill him, but they were still offended. Notice that the indications are that Mary and her family were still living in that town, brethren. And that they perhaps moved to Capernaum, where Jesus had a a home there. If that was the case, perhaps they moved because they were ostracized by their relatives in Nazareth, you see. Now let us now notice, first of all, with verse 3, that clearly Mary was not a perpetual virgin. Four brothers, four sons are mentioned, and then sisters, plural. So she had at least six other children besides Jesus. Verse 5, Jesus was terribly disappointed. He could do there no mighty work. Now, verse 5, he could don't do no mighty work there, except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. He was still unable to get through to those people closest to him in the years that he had grown up. John chapter 7 verse 1, beginning verse 1. I seem like going like those waves who just go and come roaring and they tumbled me yesterday. Yes, it was an experience. I felt like being tumbled in a washing machine after those waves. Oceans of Australia that just tumbled me left and right. So I'm tumbling you to the scriptures now. Why not? Tumbling you by giving you everything in chronological order, brethren, so you have at least the view how it all developed. So this made life very difficult for Mary, John chapter 7, and for the rest of the family, because Jesus, to a certain extent, was the black sheep of the family, just like I was, just like many of you are. It was causing them all kinds of trouble at home. And his family, on occasion, would, his own family would on occasion challenge him, be even cynical to, with him and critical of him. John 7, getting now towards the end of Christ's ministry, verse 1. After these things, Jesus walked in Galilee, for he did not want to walk in Judea, you see, because the Jews sought to kill him. Interesting. He's in Galilee, but the Jews in Judea want to see him. So who lives in the Galilee, you see? The Benjamites live in Galilee. <laughs> they still don't, they're not going to kill him, you know. And by the way, speaking of that, you always have a very, very warm greetings from our prospective member whose name and last name is very, a little bit diff- diff- difficult to, uh, to pronounce, but Hoover, that means, uh, uh, does it mean mighty, mighty warrior or something, from Norway. He is a millionaire, he is 31 years old, and he tells me all the time, he reads the Bible, and he listens to all the messages, he, he wants to repent and he wants to be baptized. That will be next year, hopefully. So I'm supposed to go among the Benjamites. But he tells me all the time that they're also very, they, they, they don't like him reading the Bible. His own family doesn't like it anyway. But nevertheless, I'm wondering, you know, if I go among the Benjamites, will I be safer than if I go among the Jews? <laughs> and I went among the Jews, but when I look like them, I do have some part of me is Jewish anyway. They would always address me sometimes in Hebrew. Now I say I, I love I, I'm proud of my Jewish heritage. Sadly, I don't know Hebrew yet, but nevertheless, I have to tell you this: this was, brethren, this is another another piece of history that was back in 2017. There was a conference on the uh, tribes of Israel, and the Jews and the Israelites tried to kind of make a conference of approaching to one another, not to convert one another. That was supposedly the goal, but to kind of become extend a friendly friendly uh, hands to one another and to kind of try to establish some. Some truth so that the Jews, the, the point was that the Jews would understand that they're not, all Christians are not anti-Semites, and uh, that hopefully we would also understand the Jews better in their culture. And it was a very nice, it was a big cinema hall. But you know, for three years, for three days, better I listened to those rabbis, and then I realized who Jesus Christ was dealing with when he was on this earth. You know, they were constantly trying, to belittling him. We, the Christians, did agree we will not mention the name of Christ so that we will not offend them, but uh, we would just keep historical decorum. My, my duty was to deliver a speech on the migration of Israelites through the valley of Danube to the northwest Europe because Danube was used to be called Ishtar, the river of Danube anyway, so that was my role, and I was speaking on the third day of the conference, the day actually that Donald Trump was visiting Jerusalem, so the whole city was blocked and so on. Nevertheless, many people made it to the cinema hall. But three, for all those previous days, I've been listening, I've been listening to those rabbis putting down Jesus Christ constantly. Calling him uh, a name, calling him a historical whatever, but they did it so subtly, you wouldn't believe. Well, Jews are very smart people. Uh, so uh, they did it very subtly, but my heart would just, every time, I, I would have like a sword pricking my heart, you know. And I was wondering, what shall I do? There was a break just before my presentation, and uh, 
one wonderful man from Canada approaches me and says, Sasha, I've been listening to all the things about against Jesus. What do you I said, Look, David, I'm 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 very upset and I'm now praying here to God now to give me enough strength to tell all of these Jews that I have to mention Jesus Christ now because they're really not respecting us. So I feel that if I deny him before the man, I would be guilty and I cannot go back to Serbia without really telling them what they have to know. Because among the false accusations, brethren, there was that Constantine the Great canonized the New Testament. That was their accusation. And that the Revelation synagogue of Satan does refer to the Jews. And that's the proof how the, how the Christians hate the Jews. Anyway, so I get up after that break and I'm praying. I said, Father, if this is... And by the way, Cinema House overlooks the, the Valley of Hinnom, uh, the, the Gehenna. It's right on the, on the very, on the very, very uh, what do you call it? So this is like the Hinnom House here and there you see Gehenna there. I'm like, if they're going to throw me off this, off this window into the cliff, may it be so. But I'm not going to deny you, Father. I said, I'm not going to deny Jesus Christ at all. So I get up there. There's some technical issues. They cannot really start recording my, my presentation. And then I address both crowds anyway. And I first said, first of all, I said, my Jewish brothers, I have to, for three days, I said, my soul has been pricked and I've been listening to all of these ideas that you put forth, which are not true. So I explained to them who actually the, uh, who canonized the New Testament. I said it was the Jews, the followers of Jesus Christ, <laughs> and uh, the Apostle John being the last one. He was a Jew, by the way. So Constantine has nothing to do with that. Constantine is guilty of some other things, I told them. And uh, I also mentioned to them that... Uh, uh, what was the other accusation? I, I, I refuted that one. I could see some of them walking out. I'm thinking, go go ahead, just walk out. Nevertheless, the rest of the Jewish people listened to what I said. Then I addressed those who were Israelites. I said, you're so obsessed with coming to the land. You know, they're all, they're those people from usually from mostly from Anglo-Saxon world, they're just obsessed with coming to the land because they read that Israelites will come to their land. But I said, you're putting the cart before the horse. First, you have to be the lights to your nations. And then in the second exodus, again, our topic for the Sabbath, then in the second exodus, you're coming to the land. But you want to come to the land, this is a Jewish land. This is a home of the Jewish people. They want Judaism here. They want to be Jews. They don't want you, a bunch of you, Anglo-Saxons and others, because you're not Jews. Why don't you get it in your mind? How come you don't understand these scriptures? They don't, brethren. They don't. But I said, you know, you're putting the car, car before the horse. And it's not going to work. Nevertheless, everybody heard me. And after that, all those Christians came and said, oh, we are so relieved. Somebody at least told, tell, told those Jews that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. And many Jews came to me and they just kind of welcomed me and said, you know, because I'm from Serbia, Serbia is known for uh, for a rare country in Europe that did not commit Holocaust. And many Jews know that. And uh, many of them suffered along with the Serbs anyway. So uh, that was interesting. But I was risking perhaps my life. But I was ready for, I was ready for that when I saw how haughty and how uh, arrogant they were. And obviously they were trying to convert these Israelites to Judaism. That's another story. So we realized all of that. And uh, But I gave them a good lesson before I left. So, so I'm proud of that. But there is one, at least there are some other good things out of there. Uh, I managed to, uh, they, they, they invited me to become the panel and then there were questions and answers. And I, I convinced some of the participants there to put the question about the Great Tribulation and certain interesting questions. Thankfully, those questions got you know picked up and then I was able to respond to that. So there was a good witness in Jerusalem, even back in 2017, to both the House of Judah and the House of Israel. But, uh, ha, what can I say? Uh, 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 yeah, the point was the uh, he went to the Galilee. Because the Benjamites were there, you know. So I'm going to the, Gal to the Galilee in a few months as well. I'm going among the Benjamites. Some of my ancestors were left-handed as well. You know, the Benjamin, the tribe of Benjamin was, was uh, traditionally left-handed. So, you know, I don't know what will happen to in Norway. Perhaps they throw me off the cliff into a fjord. But that might be right. But, you know, considering his, his historical record here, that probably won't happen. <laughs> But anyway, so that all, you all know that I survived Gehenna. I was right there because the cinema house looks right, overlooks Gehenna. Nowadays they use it for theater and theater and whatever other, you know, performances. But it's there. It's right over Gehenna. So I'm like, if these mad Jews just run, run get me and, 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 and throw me there, be it so to your glory, God, I said, but I cannot go back home and allow them to get away with this belittling of Jesus Christ. 
You know, we, we all agree that, again, we will not mention Jesus Christ, but we didn't expect them to be so disrespectful anyway of us. So we are in John chapter 7. Look what happens. So he was in Galilee. So he stayed out of Judea in this period of time. Verse 2. Now the Jews' feast of tabernacles was at hand. Now, of course, it's not the Jews' feast. It's the feast of the Lord. But the Jews remained faithful at the time to that feast. Israelites were already gone. They were just gone and, and got assimilated into the nations. Brethren, what happened to them is exactly what they wanted. They always wanted to be pagans. So God said, fine, you're going to be now kicked out of your land. You're going to be scattered all over the place. And guess what? Because you want to be pagans, you're going to be assimilated into pagan nations. And consequently, you will lose your identity. But I have to tell you, in many Gentile nations today... There are people who are waking up and realizing that there is something different about them. And they're coming to recognize, uh, especially in Asia, they're coming to recognize that they're obvious from the lost tribes of Israel. Anyway, so the feast was at hand, and now his brothers challenged him. Now, come, now comes the greatest challenge of all, when your wives, your brothers, your sisters, your relatives challenge you. Verse 3, his brothers therefore said to him, Depart from here and go into Judea, that your disciples may also see the works that you are doing. Oh, how how caring and loving are they for the work of God. Really? Yeah, sure. No, brethren, they knew he was avoiding Judea and staying in Galilee because the Jews were seeking to heal him. Look at this. Depart and go into Judea. In other words, they didn't really want him at home. Why? Well, most likely because he was notorious by this time. He was notorious and other neighbors despised Jesus Christ. Even though he did great miracles, they certainly did not believe he was the Messiah because they had watched him grow up. They had seen him play in the dirt. You know, what kind of a Messiah is that? Depart from here and go into Judea. We are in John chapter 7. So depart from here and go into Judea that your disciples also may see the works that you are doing. Verse 4. For no one does anything in secret while he himself seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. In other words, don't just stay in the Galilee. More or less they were saying, please leave, you know, please leave, the door is over there, you know, just, you know, just leave, leave us alone, enough. Verse 5, for even his brothers, brethren, do you realize this? For even his brothers did not believe in him. Now, they did not believe in him, they did not believe that he was the Messiah, and that, brethren, includes not just brothers and sisters, but evidently involves, to a certain extent, Mary, if she did not understand fully Jesus Christ's Messiahship. Now, in summary, after this point, we have seen that Mary's reputation was tarnished. We have seen the four circumstances that she had to travel, in one case to have a birth in Bethlehem. They were then forced to emigrate for the fear of their lives. She was widowed early in life. She could not understand many of her son's actions, and not with animosity, but out of maternal love, she was opposed to Christ's ministry. You see, Mary's life, brethren, was far from the total bliss that Catholics would believe, and that stigma of fornication stayed with her all her days, not just in the locality of Nazareth, that gossip was spread around and it came to the fore again when Jesus came to national fame. Let's notice John chapter 8 and beginning in verse 40. John 8, beginning in verse 40, Jesus said to the Pharisees and the Jews, But now you seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth which I heard from God. Abraham did not do this. That's verse 40, verse 41. You do the deeds of your father. And then those Jews and Pharisees of Jerusalem, who during the early life of Jesus Christ were total strangers to him, said, We were not born of fornication. We have one father God. Do you see? We were not born of fornication. Uh Aha. You see that stigma that followed Mary, you see? Where did they get that fornication bit from, you know? Well, when they heard Jesus Christ's faith, they wonder, who in the world is this person? How does, how does he do all those miracles? So they sent some of their men back to his hometown to establish the background of that individual. So they went around questioning people and the old gossip surfaced again in Nazareth when those people showed up there to check up on Jesus. So brethren, the stigma stayed with Mary all her days. Her obedience to God brought her a certain amount of sorrow. Now surely, There was joy, and I'm sure that joy outweighed the sorrow in her heart, in her life. But what we are contrasting is the real Mary of the Bible to the false Mary of Catholicism. And I'm afraid to say even of Protestantism, because Protestants are falling, it seems to me, it seems to me at least, more and more for Catholic ideas. One good example of that, a case in point, is those supposed three magi. 
But you see, they're hiding the identity of those Magi brethren because many of your kinsmen here in Australia and New Zealand would have to ask themselves, who in the world was, uh, uh, what, what in the world was this Parthian Empire? And who in the world are those ten tribes of Israel that Josephus mentions beyond the Euphrates? Then, of course, for Mary, there was the final blow. John 19, beginning in verse 25. The day when the sword really pierced to her heart. John 19, 25. Now there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing by, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, that disciple took her to his own home. So the Bible, brethren, is in dealing with the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. He's doing it in a very good taste. It doesn't give us all the horrible details. It gives us enough on the surface. We can have a measure of understanding of the pain and agony that Jesus Christ went through, but only in measure. The full depth of what Jesus Christ went through emotionally and physically is not really registered with us until the resurrection, when we will be the spirit beings and we'll look back on it in history, in vision, and we'll see the 24-hour period and all that he went through. The Bible did not choose to be gruesome. It deals with things circumspectly, but sufficiently that we can understand the measure of the heartache and that was involved in what we read between the lines. Now, perhaps, underneath her grief, Mary had a sense of her son's ultimate victory. And her sense of his ultimate victory may be indicated by what took place in Acts chapter 1, because Jesus gave Mary into the hands of John, not into the hands of one of his brothers, an indication that Jesus intended that Mary now be brought into the church of God with his disciples. Think about it, brethren, think about it. As it turns out, not only Mary, but some of his relatives as well. Because as far as I I can understand the Bible, John, John the Revelator was actually his first cousin. He was the son of Mary's sister. And when I said that Mary was righteous but not converted, we find in Luke chapter 23, 32, that Jesus said to Peter... When you are converted, strengthen your brethren, you see. So God's Spirit was working with those disciples. They did not oppose Jesus Christ's work. They supported Him. God's Spirit was working with them. But it was not yet in them. Just like it was working with you, but until yesterday, it was not in some of you, you see. And conversion would come when the Holy Spirit entered them on the day of Pentecost. And of course, the conversion is a growing process, brethren, thereafter, as I explained to you yesterday. But as Christ said to Peter, when you are converted, he said it at the end of the book of Luke, because Peter at this point, at that point, was not yet in that state. And neither, of course, brethren, was Mary. But let us now, let us now notice Acts chapter 1, beginning in verse 13. Just like in ocean, when you just about think that those waves have died and they will not come again, then all of a sudden, just like here, you just think it's the, it's about the end. But here comes another way of understanding. We have Acts one thirteen and fourteen. Yes, those waves were quite incredible yesterday. I cannot say it was my first experience, but this was my first experience with Australian waves. So they tumbled me very well. I resisted for about a couple of hours, and I thought, I think this is enough. So I'm tumbled and well washed, <laughs> so can I now go, go home? Acts one thirteen, And when they had entered, they went up into the upper room where they were staying, Peter, James, John, and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon, Simon the Zealot, and Judas, the son of James. You probably wonder what happened to all those people. Well... I'll have to deliver a special message one of these days, uh, perhaps after the feast, and you'll know where they all went. They all went, of course. Guess where? Did they go to the cities of Samaria? No. They went to the lost sheep of Israel, brethren. But it was not revealed in the book of Acts because it was not yet time for the world to know where the ten tribes went, you see. And they will realize once again, there's only one church era that was given the key of David, meaning the understanding of the lost tribes, you see. Keep that always in mind, brethren, because that's a marking point for Philadelphians, other than brotherly love, that they they fully understand 
the identity of the true Israel. Anyway, verse 14, these all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. At long last, brethren, at long last, his brothers did turn to Jesus Christ, and so did his mother. And they were a part of the great event that is recorded later in Acts chapter 2, when God's Spirit is given was given in power. That, of course, did not end Mary's troubles because later on they were forced to flee from the promised land. And if you wonder where did they flee, well, let me just titillate your curiosity. The history shows that they fled, oh, nevertheless, to Gaul, once called Gaul and today called France. And then later, after that, from France, they moved to, oh, across the sea to good old England or to the British Isles. You wouldn't believe how many of his disciples went there. But one of these days, I'll just present you, I'll give you a historical presentation on that. You wouldn't believe how many of them went there, including the remains of the Apostle Peter. The Apostle Peter was not killed in Rome, brethren. Uh, the uh, Babylon mentioned, you have to realize, in the first century, there was a province called Babylon, when many Jews lived because they did not return with Ezra and Nehemiah back to Judea. So Peter went, he was the apostle to the Jews, he went to the Jews, he was killed in the Babylon really, yes, but it wasn't was Rome, it was a province. Then his remains later came to Babylon, but according to historical records, uh, King uh, Pope Vitalian sent in 8th century the remains of Paul, Peter and several other martyrs to the English King Oswy, who was trying to be a very devout Catholic, so out of his fatherly love for him, the remains of Peter were sent to England. In fact, to the place where today is the seat of the of the Anglican Church. And knowing that, I wrote to the Anglican Church back in 2013, I think. 13 or 14. 13, I think, was after the feast, I remember. So I'm writing, I wrote that to their archives and said, is it true that, and after a week, just before the Sabbath starts, here I come, Cressida Williams very nicely writes a message, yes, it's true, our records show that they came here, but you know, they, our church is called the Church of Peter and Paul, but you know, we, we, we don't have, they're certainly not here in the church, there it remains, because King Oswald was in the north, up in the north of England, so the remains of Peter would be sent up in the north of England. Wonderful. So they could not find his, his remains. What they are showing today as remains of the Apostle Peter, brethren, are actually the Peter, Peter, or the Pater, Pater Simon Magus. Simon Magus is lying there, lying there under the, under the Catholic main altar in Vatican. And uh, there are proofs of that, but that's another story. Now, when I say that Mary did not fully understand her son as the Messiah, we need to realize, brethren, that that was not anything really special. Thousands of people who followed Jesus Christ and saw his miracles and heard his preaching did not really believe he was the Messiah. Matthew chapter 16, verse 13. We may read the Gospels assuming that everyone who saw those miracles had to believe that he was who he said he was. But brethren, it's not the case. You see, in Mark, he said twice that their hearts were hardened. They supported Jesus. They loved Jesus Christ, but they still did not understand everything that he said, and their hearts were hardened. So we are in Matthew 16, 14. When Jesus came into the region of Caesarea, Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Now, around the country by that time, he performed many miracles. So he asked the disciples, what are the people, what are people saying about me? Were they saying that Jesus Christ had to be uh, Messiah, certainly? No, they were not. The Jewish concept of the Messiah, I told you, was about only one coming, you see, not two. Not, not the Lamb of God and then the Lion of Judah. They thought of a coming of a great power to deliver them from Rome. They didn't believe in his first coming as a meek servant. They, that was not better in their concept. You know, that was not the concept of the disciples nor of Mary because that was not how they were educated by the teachers of the Old Testament at that time, you see. They were all not realizing Jesus Christ, the Messiah, has to come twice. So in verse 14, so they said, some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. Verse 15, he said to them, but who do you think, who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter, the true Simon Peter, answered and said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood 
has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. You see, brethren, it took God revealing it to a person who Jesus Christ really is. And that he was not just some great prophet, he was actually the Messiah. So thousands, you know, followed him. That's true, but didn't really understand, understood who he was. Even John the Baptist, who proclaimed the coming of the Messiah, who had baptized Jesus Christ, who had seen the Holy Spirit descending as a dove upon his head, at the end of his life began to have doubts. Well, why? Remember, he sent in prison. Are you the one? When he was in prison, are you the one who is prophesied or shall we wait for another one? Why did jo- uh, uh, John the Baptist have doubts? Well, brethren, because Jesus didn't do things they expected the Messiah to do. You see, they expected something far greater. They expected a mighty man who is going to now to read the revolution, get rid of the Romans, and make Judea the dominant power of the world. Oh, but that was not the plan for Judea. That was the plan for who? That was the plan for you people. You descendants of Ephraim, because, you know, France, Reuben, lost his birthright, and you descendants of Ephraim got it. So you now, for time being yet, are dominating the world until the time comes that it ends. So anyway, Jews expected that from the Messiah. Messiah didn't deliver to their expectations. Oh, how horrible. So they thought, well, Jesus must not. In spite of all these miracles, he may not be the Messiah. Mary was brought to conversion and was brought into God's church. And Mary supported God's work at the end. Brethren, this is the real Mary. And Mary who suffered great trials and hardships, not the Mary of Catholicism. In conclusion, finally the last wave comes your way, so now you can be relieved. In conclusion, let's take a look at the other Mary. You will not need any notes for this one, but the Mary of Catholicism, and see how that false Mary will play possibly a role in some of the coming events of the end time. Look, brethren, the current Pope is an ardent believer in the power of Virgin Mary. So she has been invariably described among the Catholics as the mother of God, as the queen of the universe, and famous queen of heaven, as you know, that's always brought up at Easter. Now, an apparition claiming to be Mary first appeared not in Bosnia and Herzegovina, but first appeared in famous Fatima, Portugal, in 1917. And on that occasion, the apparition divulged an end-time secret to three children of a Portuguese shepherd. And ever since there have been various operations of various sorts. The secret basically was that the world would enter peace when Russia gets converted to Virgin Mary, that is to Catholicism. Did you know that? Well, if you didn't, now you do, brethren. Now, of course, this is highly unlikely. (laughs) It's highly unlikely that something like that would ever happen. And if Russia does not get converted to Catholicism, the world would collapse. That's what Fatima 1917 was the secret of that so-called revelation. Well, the world seems to be collapsing to a certain extent, but no, we know it's not the true, it's not the true scenario according to the Bible. So, they may well come nevertheless that the Europeans will think that it is the will of Mary for them to invade Russia and force it into Catholic fold lest the world collapse according to the Fatima prophecy of 1917. Now, they haven't still invaded Russia, as you know. They're using Ukraine, actually, as a probing rod, you know, trying to actually provoke Russia. It doesn't work. It will not work. (coughs) Now, in Revelation chapter 9, we are shown two great woes. The first woe is when Europe attacks Russia, and we usually think of that as being a political move, and it certainly is, when they try to conquer Russia in the first woe. But it may be more than just a political move, brethren. It may well be a religious move, because they may not have succeeded in bringing Russia into the Catholic fold, and not wanting the world to collapse, as the Fatima prophecy said in 1917. And that prophecy said, the world will collapse unless Russia is fully converted to Christianity. And therefore, they may also have a religious motive for the invasion of Russian hemisphere, the false great prophet might proclaim it as the holy war and the final crusade of the Catholic Church. See? Revelation 17, uh, 16. I'm not going to read it, but you probably know it. Of course, yeah, well, go to there. Revelation 17, 16. We know that the second woe is a Russian counterattack against the United States of Europe. But if the false prophet, brethren of the end time, whichever pope it might be, perhaps this one or somebody else, if that pope 
refers back to Fatima, to the Fatima prophecy and say, we must invade Russia to bring it to Catholicism because the Queen of Peace, as she calls herself, calls there cannot be world peace until the Russians are converted to Christianity. We therefore must invade that nation and force it to Catholicism. Brethren, 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 the ten rules of Europe will go ahead. And they will lose because the second woe is the Russian counterattack. So having been blessed by that future Pope and led by the European dictator in that crusade and then having failed, what do we think would be their reaction toward Rome and toward the Catholic Church? Revelation 17.6 And then the ten horns which you saw on the beast, these will hate the harlot, make her desolate and naked, eat her flesh and burn her with fire. Brethren, Rome would be put to the torch at some point, possibly because of the Russian counter-invasion of Europe and the Fatima prophecy will finally die. Nevertheless, the prophecy lives for now. In the minds of millions of Catholics, the Virgin Mary lives and the current Pope believes in the Fatima prophecy. So then, it may not only be a political, but also a religious move when the first woe takes place. I hope that, uh, if nothing else, you've learned something today. But if nothing else, now we have a message with chronological order about the true Mary of the Bible, the true mother of Jesus Christ.